A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week. A mother's need for vengeance against a man she believed had sexually assaulted her 12-year-old daughter gets out of control and takes an innocent life. The mother rounded up a posse to go after the suspected sex offender after she discovered a video the man took of the alleged assault. There was a gun battle and a teen was killed in the crossfire. Now that mother will spend the rest of her life in prison and the man she was after may still be held accountable. He's been charged with sexually assaulting her daughter. But first, what kind of a man allegedly plots to sexually assault his unborn child? The FBI says that they had to act quickly before the baby was born to prevent a sexual attack. The authorities say that they uncovered these plans while investigating a group of people sharing child sex abuse material. Get this. Not only was he a veterinarian, well-respected, but he was also a well-known judge at the famous Westminster Dog Show. We're recording this on Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Our guest today is Caitlin Becker, a former senior reporter for the Daily Mail. Caitlin has a new job. She is now the national correspondent for News Nation. She's a dear friend of the show. Caitlin, congratulations on this new job. How exciting. Thank you so much, Anna. It is very exciting. I've been so busy. It's been two months at News Nation and it's been pretty much nonstop, which of course I love. Oh my goodness. So are you still covering crime or are you doing a bunch of other stuff? I'm covering pretty much everything. I've been doing quite a bit of crime. I was in Athens, Georgia for a whole week when Riley when Lake and Riley went missing and when she was covering her murder. So I was there sort of on the ground. I've covered Riley Strain. We're doing, of course, Daybell. Um, but I also am covering general news as well. So the bridge collapse in Baltimore, I'm going up for the eclipse this week. So I'm covering a little bit of everything all week and weekend. Wow. Wow. Well, congratulations. We're so happy for you. Um, and thank you so much for making time because you're so super busy. Always, always for you. Oh, that's so wonderful. I mean, y'all are so incredible. Our contributors last week, Dr. Judy Ho released a new book. I mean, y'all are amazing. So, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our first case today, honestly, Caitlin, is nothing short of disgusting. Disgusting. It's one of the worst cases I have ever reported on. It's one of the worst cases, certainly, that you and I have done together. And this is one that stays with you. It is. If these allegations are true, this man needs to be locked up forever. But we know that the law will never permit such a thing. Um, We're talking here about a veterinarian who police say was planning to sexually assault his new son as soon as the baby was born. The baby was being carried by a surrogate in California and... This man and his husband in Elburn, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, had set up a contract with this woman for a baby. The two were married, and this was the first child that they were expecting. I cannot believe the things which the FBI says was written by this man to others in this perverted group sharing this material. What the FBI accuses this man of is some of the most grotesque actions I have ever read. You mean, talk about an innocent life. The life isn't even born yet here. According to court documents, Anna, that I had been reading earlier, the baby's due date was March 29th. So it should have been sort of right around now that this baby would have been born. But we actually don't know since his arrest what happened to the situation with the baby, if it went with the husband, if the surrogate has it, if it's with the state. We don't we don't know. But as far as I'm concerned, while this is working its way through court, I'm grateful this baby is not with that man. Oh, absolutely. That man is currently locked up. And um, of course, innocent until proven guilty. These are allegations. As far as, again, we want to make clear, again, the allegations are that this man was going to take actions on this baby, preparing to take uh, a, a physical violent action against this baby. But the FBI intervened. So 
that time was of the essence with this baby um, arriving. So the accused here is 39-year-old Adam Stafford King, who's been arrested and charged with distribution of child pornography pornography after an FBI sting operation. The FBI says that he allegedly shared child sex abuse material on two encrypted platforms. He allegedly bragged about abusing his nieces and nephews including his unborn child. It's unclear to me how that may have happened, but that was also an allegation. This is so troubling. These communications and these materials were shared over the course of a year from December 2023 to January of this year. And as you said, Caitlin, the baby was due at the end of March. We don't know whether that baby has arrived into the world, uh, but we are certainly hoping that the authorities have kept that baby as safe as possible. Now, Here's what I find also interesting about this man, because he was fairly prominent in his world. Whether we know him or not, he was prominent in the two areas of expertise that he had. And, and so, as I always say, when you get on an elevator, you have no idea who you are standing next to, and you don't know their stories, which can be very scary. So, I concur. <laughs> After right? having worked okay. on plenty of these cases, Anna, yeah, every, all of that kind of worries me. Absolutely. You can never assume just because a person is prominent in their field. Okay, at the time, because sometimes people will let their guard down when they see someone who is very successful. So at and the you know, time. It's part mm-hmm. of his prominence that actually is what got him caught in the crosshairs of the FBI, but I'm sure you're going to get to that in a second when you lay out exactly how they got in contact with him. Right, because he kept revealing things about himself between the handle he used on these encrypted apps, um, how he told people what he did for a living, that the baby was coming. He shared a sonogram Mm -hmm. of the baby. So much that literally is like a trail of breadcrumbs back to him. So at the time, Adam King worked as a veterinary ophthalmologist, so um, a a vet who specialized in eye problems, and we know lots of dogs have eye problems. He had been employed at Chicago's MedVet since 2019, and his biography has since been removed from their website. Now, additionally, Adam was a dog breeder specializing in Havanese dogs. He was also a well-known show judge. So, you know, he did local um, dog shows, but he was scheduled to be at Westminster this year. The big show that they the do dog show. York. The dog show. The dog show, right? Best in breed. We all watch it. You know, we, we're obsessed with unbelievable. Well, the Kennel Club has since revoked this judge's privileges. Now, a little bit of Adam's background, just so we can put everything in perspective here. And then we're going to get to the horrible details on, on some stuff. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to repeat it because it's too horrific. Adam is married to a pastor. He and his husband, Lucas, married in 2016. The couple expecting this first child. Here's what's interesting. Police say that Adam shared on these apps that his husband had zero interest, no interest in children. Thank God for that. But um, I find that very interesting, as if it was a divide. Yeah, but particularly since... As we get through this, both prosecutors, investigators, and the husband himself had said that they had no, he had no idea. He had absolutely no idea. Prosecutors believed that Adam was living a double life and that his husband didn't know. So how, I feel like you have to ask if you're into something like that in order to know the answer is no. So it just makes me question if perhaps there were some clues that were overlooked because who would think that about their spouse? It is possible, but we have seen so many cases, whether it's a predator or whether it's a serial killer, how the family, the other mate had no idea, knew something and maybe would have been prosecutors believe it. Yeah, prosecutors right. said they firmly believe that this guy was living, fully living a double life, which also in and of itself is just terrifying to think that you're living in your own home with someone you think you know, someone that you think you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And it turns out they're... Uh, someone you couldn't even, you wouldn't want to be in a room with. You know, Caitlin, a a few months ago, uh, we included one of the cases that uh, another FBI sting, this was 
an investigative producer who I used to work with, right? Caught up in the exact same kind of a sting situation where he was on an encrypted app. I believe it was um, one of these and was sharing um, this child sex abuse material. He was arrested. And I, I don't know the disposition of the case, whether it's gone to trial or not. So that's what I mean. Here's someone who literally yeah. was one office next to me. That's wild. And you just never know. You don't know. And I remember when he was moving his family to the L.A. area and he had a daughter, a teenage daughter, a little bit, you know, maybe around the age of my son. And I was helping him um, describing different schools and school districts. Oh, Meanwhile, goodness. right. So. When I say we have no idea. We just don't. We don't. It's horrific. The whole thing is so scary. Okay, back to Adam. So authorities say that they found Adam while investigating child sex abuse materials on the apps Scruff and Telegram. Now, they were monitoring a suspect in New York who was on their radar. And that's when they allegedly discovered Adam, who was using this handle on Telegram, Perv chai dude okay hints chai chicago dude man okay two things that turn out to be true here again innocent until proven guilty now police allege that on september 11th of 2023 the perv chai dude account sent images and videos depicting the abuse of children to the new york suspect The next month, the authorities got permission from the New York suspect to to pretend to take over his account, pretend to be him, to continue the communications with this man and others, presumably. Okay, so in these conversations, police say that Adam boasted about a large collection of child pornography. He claimed that he preferred children in the single digits, meaning you know, nine and younger. And he reportedly was interested in both minor boys and girls, but preferred boys. I just, I can't. Um, Then police allege that Adam um, shared the media and fantasies, and he bragged about having abused minors. Now, here's the troubling, well, this is all troubling, but Caitlin, you know, in court records, they're saying that he bragged about... um, assaulting his nephews and nieces and nothing's come out in the court about that yet. Um, Obviously they're minors. I have to hope an investigation is happening into that. I don't, I mean, we don't even know if he has any actual nephews or nieces, but I was reading in um, some court documents as well. He allegedly also said that two years ago, the message was two years ago that he alleged that he raped a four-year-old. So that to me is very specific in time and age and would be a very good lead for investigators to go off of to see who in his life was that age two years prior to that time. So I have to imagine that there is another investigation going on simultaneously because they, you know, prosecutors are confident they have him on the charges that they've filed so far and that's working its way through court. But I anticipate additional charges in the future. It's possible. Again, he's not charged with an assault. He's charged with the possession of this material. And one of the things that, you know, we often discuss is um, how do you separate out someone's horrific, abusive fantasies and the acting out of those actions? But here the law is clear. The possession of the material is illegal, period. That's it. So um, this is the base from which they start. And we'll see. And I pray to God that there aren't that there aren't real victims. Me too. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, and every child in any of those videos and photographs, they are victims. Of course. I'm, I'm talking about someone that he may have physically assaulted here. I want to be clear about that. So he also, um, you know, gave other details. Like he said, the way he abused his nieces and nephews, according to the FBI, was that he would give them large doses of Benadryl, twice the amount that you would give an adult. Now, that's an awful lot. That's a lot. And the investigators allege that in communications that he had, he said that he did this in order to have a sort of wide safety margin. And there were also some quotes that 
investigators attribute to Adam in these documents. And according to court documents, he at one point said that he needed to not you know, harm them physically in a way that could be, you know, essentially seen by relatives, which is something that sat with me in a pretty disturbing way to even suggest that. Um, yeah, that I, uh, this is one of the hardest cases that, you know, we've worked on and we don't even know if these victims exist because we don't know if he actually has nieces and nephews, but even just the saying of it is really, really disturbing. And what's interesting in this case, Anna, I feel like when we cover child uh, child abuse, child sexual abuse, oftentimes with these sting operations, it is an an investigator posing as someone who's younger and then kind of trapping that in very to catch a predator. I find this one so interesting that they used an already established suspect who was a person talking about this stuff on these platforms and then slipped in and replaced them, which I think is a really um, creative way to continue. And like, they don't need to establish a relationship with, you know, perv chai dude. It's already there. So I think that was a really smart move by investigators. And the the thing is, he was so specific, as you said, about certain things. Let's talk about the sonogram. So we know, we know it's been confirmed by the FBI. We know that there was a baby that was arriving on March 29th. So this was a surrogate. And he shared on this app a, uh, an image of the baby. Now, that's a pretty specific thing. Now, we've also seen cases where people have bought all sorts of materials pretending to be pregnant. But in this case, this part of the story, according to the FBI, is true. As well so, as an image of a onesie. Right. The onesie that had been purchased in preparation for the arrival of the baby. And he did say what he was going to do to the baby, and I'm just not going to repeat that. I, I It was hard to even read. No, not, not even going... Not even going to repeat that. Now, here's the other thing. In these conversations, according to the FBI, he invited or said that he would invite these new friends of his, fellow perverts, um, to come over and abuse the baby. It's hard to believe that these conversations happen anywhere, let alone the actions. Um, The fact that this communication as alleged by law enforcement was happening to a member of law enforcement is like the only saving grace in this moment. Yes, absolutely. So finally, the clock is ticking. This baby is arriving and authorities must act quickly. So the FBI says that they got a search warrant for the home. They come knocking as they do unexpectedly. And this I thought was a little bizarre, Okay, they say that they announced FBI, we have a search warrant, we're here. And they did this several times. And they say, and it was the Daily Mail that was reporting this, was that Adam remained in the shower on his cell phone. It's something that jumped out to me as well. I actually have the court documents up right now. And this is March 5th. And it does say the FBI executed a search warrant at defendant's home. There they encountered defendant in the shower with his Apple iPhone. Mm-hmm. that's bizarre. And they, the document goes on to say that one of these encrypted apps it showed that it had been previously installed and then deleted. So who knows if he could have allegedly been deleting things in the shower in that moment. Certainly well, would be he, my guess. His fingers didn't work fast enough because um, the FBI says that he refused to answer any questions. However, he did turn over the phone and he did provide his password And the authorities say material which they had seen on the apps was found on his phone. But that's not all the evidence that they have. This is what is even much more specific. We talked about the sonogram of the baby that was coming. Authorities say as they searched the home, they found a sonogram that looked exactly like the one that was used on the app. And And his husband confirmed it. And the husband confirmed, yes, that is our baby. Mm. And they found the onesie that you talked about. Exact same onesie. So now we have all these things that are lining up. Chai dude, Chicago guy, baby coming, baby is coming, sonogram, 
police say matches onesie photo that he provided in these communications is found at the home there was also one other image that was allegedly sent according to investigators there was a photo of a penis and against what appeared to be white scrubs that was sent through one of these encrypted apps which of course he is a veterinary ophthalmologist i don't know what color scrubs he wears but that is another another thing where they can start to put these puzzle pieces together oh i'm just so revolted I am just absolutely so disgusted here. Okay, now the FBI says that they found images uh, and videos on his phone, again, that that was shared on the apps of videos of boys between the ages of 9 and 11. Adam was later arrested. He was arrested on March 22nd and charged with knowingly distributing child pornography. At this time, it is unclear how authorities are investigating those claims of sexual assault that were made by Adam on Telegram. Okay, so again, he's not charged with these assaults, but we have to believe they're under investigation. Adam made his first court appearance last Tuesday. Well, it wasn't his first. This was an appearance specifically to determine bond. Adam's husband, father, and father-in-law all took the stand during the hearing, claiming that they were shocked. They had no idea that this was going on distancing themselves from this. Um, Adam's defense attorney was asking for the man, for Adam to be released, but under, um, you know, terms in which he could be monitored and, and guaranteeing the court that he would not have access to computers or any contact with children. And the judge said, you know what? I don't believe you and I don't believe him. And this guy, He's a threat to the community. A thousand percent. It would have been ludicrous to allow him out. And I think it speaks volumes that his husband, father, and that his family testified that they were shocked and that they had no idea about this. Because should those other allegations lead to charges and they involved family members, I think this means the family will likely cooperate to protect these children should these charges, you know, come to fruition, should these allegations turn out to be true. I do think it speaks volumes that they are not standing in front of him trying to protect him, that they're saying, oh, we had no idea about this. Yeah, this this is just a horrific case. It is, a, thank goodness that the authorities acted as quickly as they did. I mean, really, we're talking about weeks and babies can come early. So, you know, March 5th, they're searching the house. March 22nd, they're arresting him. Babies arriving March 29th. Time was of the essence. Time was of the essence. So um, it'll be interesting. We may never find out the details of what's going on with the surrogate. Uh, apparently in California, there are very specific laws about these contracts. So we're going to have a, a, a civil situation versus a, a criminal situation. But you have to think that Child Protective Services somehow can intervene here and stall things. I don't know what happens to this baby. I do and not I know, know what happens, happens to this baby. The con- contract even aside, we don't know biologically whose who baby whose baby it is. I mean, it could have been a sperm donor and it could have been either one of these of these men who were married. So we don't know biologically even who that baby belongs to. So I just am grateful that, like you said, law enforcement worked as swiftly as they did. I mean, you really, it was a ticking time bomb. They had, they had an end date that they had to hit and they put all of their ducks in a row in order to do that. And I have to imagine that if they worked that quickly to protect this baby from who they allege is a predator. And like we said, this has not been adjudicated. So these are all allegations. This is all innocent until proven guilty. They worked that swiftly to get that done. I must imagine that they are all over investigating these additional allegations. Mm -hmm. We will keep an eye on this case for you. Our next case is a tragedy on top of another tragedy. A mother who was understandably upset when she discovered that her 12-year-old daughter had been sexually assaulted. She tried to get revenge on the suspected abuser. And it all went horribly wrong. And an innocent teen was killed in this act of vengeance. A teen that had nothing to do with anything, but these were the circumstances. This case is out of Decatur, Georgia. 
Oh my God. You know, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think everyone can understand the level of frustration that a parent has when they discover that someone has harmed their child. They call the cops and the cops tell you that someone will be getting back to you and you can't control your rage because someone has, as far as you're concerned, has harmed your child. But gathering a posse, an armed posse, to go after the man, um, it was a recipe for disaster. It really was. It's so interesting to put the two cases we're talking about today in the same show because I approached the first case with disgust and I approached this case with some empathy because this is mama bear mode. This is protecting your child, but it went so far out of control that someone else's child lost their life. So this is why you don't take the law into your own hands. But, you know, sort of in my heart of hearts, I empathize with the rage and the protectiveness that this mother went through when she found out that her daughter had been sexually abused. I often am so surprised at how people can truly refrain from taking action against someone, even you know, we see these eruptions in court. We see these things. I mean, families have to sit there for hours and days and look at pictures and listen to abuse. And you see them erupting in courtrooms and they're always being dragged away and carried away as if they are the criminal when they are the victims here. You know, but I understand you have to keep decorum. You have to keep the courtroom safe. But who among us cannot understand the rage of a parent wanting their own version of justice. And wanting to handle it quickly and wanting to make up for the fact that I'm sure there is no matter what, no matter how irrational it is to think this, that there's got to be some guilt there, that there was one moment where you didn't protect your child and this is what happened. And so you will go and you will do what needs to be done at that point where this kind of took a turn. And I have worked on cases where parents have gone out and taken their own justice and have gone and they've gotten their sentence and said, worth it. I will happily go to prison because I did what needed to be done for my family. In this instance, it wasn't just her. Her rage filtered out to a posse and someone in that posse then lost their life. And so you know, taking justice into your own hands is never acceptable and it is a crime and you will have to pay for that. But we, like you said, everyone can kind of understand that rage, but you feel for the victim here. There's two victims here. There's three victims here. There's the mother, there's the child, and then there's the person who lost their life. The mother and the convicted killer here is 42 year old Danielle Harris. Now, this is the mom who took justice into her own hands when she found out someone had hurt her child. She rounded up a group of friends and some of them armed. And in the middle of all this, an innocent life is lost. So let's break this case down. Let's talk a little bit about the background, how we got there, and then what happened. So on March 31st of 2020, Police say that Danielle discovered a video of her then 12-year-old daughter allegedly being sexually abused by a man identified as Antonio Harley, who was 22 at the time. The next day at around 3.30 a.m., Danielle reported the incident to police. She tells an officer what happened, and then he says to her, someone will be following up with you. And it feels like in that moment, she started, this, this, this pain started festering and that she needed to act upon this. You hear someone will follow up with you when you're calling your insurance company. You hear oh someone God, will yes. call it when you call in your bank. It's not what you want to hear when you're reporting something like this, it's something this grievous to a member of law enforcement. And I Imagine that in that moment, it was obvious that she was irate because the officer reportedly cautioned her against trying to do something, against trying to take matters into her own hand. Uh, and he reportedly cautioned her against letting her rage get the best of her. So I feel like they anticipated perhaps something like this happening because she may have been so emotional in that moment. And it turns out they were certainly right to be concerned. 
Well, hours later, she gets a group together to go to Antonio's apartment to confront the man. Reportedly, there were three members of the group who were armed. Around 1 p.m., according to police, the mother had her daughter point out the apartment. And then the angry mob, because that is what they were, went to the apartment, knocking on the front door. Antonio, the man that they're looking for, darts out the back. Then they run and they chase him. So you can just imagine this. And what I don't know, but I have to assume, is that the guns are out. It just seemed to be chaos at this point. I mean, even if the guns aren't out at this point, if you're this guy and there is a mob of people showing up at your house furious, you have to imagine it is just absolutely chaotic. And you've got him allegedly running out the back door and then they're coming around the back door and they force him back in the house. And certainly the guns are out at this point because gunfire erupts. Right. Then there's then there's a gun battle. So he manages to get back into his apartment. And that's when they start shooting through the door. Now, he's not alone. Antonio is not alone in his apartment. He is with five younger siblings. So he is now trying to protect himself from the mob, trying to protect his younger siblings. And in this exchange of gunfire, a member of the revenge posse is shot and killed. 19-year-old Juan Newkirk. 19 years old. it was Antonio's brother who allegedly pulled that trigger. He allegedly returned fire when they started shooting into that apartment. And that's when this 19-year-old is shot and killed. Imagine you're shooting through doors, right? This, oh God, this is just so horrible. So Danielle is arrested and booked on charges of conspiracy to commit a felony and felony murder because from the police perspective, this was her plan. This was her plan. So the alleged sex offender, Antonio Harley, he survived his gunshot wounds. He was actually injured in the middle of all this. And he was charged with statutory rape, child molestation and sexual exploitation of a child. Now, at the time of this recording, he has not yet had a trial date, but his case is pending. So innocent, and innocent, presumed innocent until proven guilty. But as you can imagine, you know, the, the fact that the authorities are still pursuing the allegations against him is a little piece of justice in all of this. Mm -hmm. And the sad part is, we may have arrived at the very same point for the mother had, and for yep, the child. Had this not have happened and the mother would not be behind bars and a 19 year old would be alive. Yeah. So and 19 the, is so young. It's 19 as a child. So to even think that in your uh, just heartbreaking rage at what you believe happened to your 12 year old, that you would bring another child along with you. It was not, you know, this wasn't a 38 year old who was in this posse. It's a 19 year old. So why are you bringing an armed 19 year old? That to me, maybe that kid should have been left home. Mm -hmm. And think about Danielle's daughter, the, the one who here says she was horribly abused. She needs her mother and her mm -hmm. mother's in prison. She has to get yeah. through this trauma without her mother. Without her mother. Yeah, you know, there is a part of me that hopes she at least knows that how incredibly loved she is because not a lot of people would have exacted revenge the way that mom did in a matter of hours of finding out these allegations that her child was abused. So, yeah, I mean, to be sentenced to life in prison is that's you can't really undo that. I mean, it is life in prison. She does have the possibility of parole. So maybe in her 80s, she could perhaps get out. But that's not a, there's not much life to live after that. No. And, you know, there is a part of me that understands from the perspective of a judge and a law and the law where, like anyone from someone in the justice system to just someone in a coffee shop could have turned to her and said, but what did you think was going to happen? Like, 
logically, you know, no good could come from this decision to grab a posse, arm yourselves and go after the man because you have no idea if he's armed on the other side. And guess what? They were. They were armed. I wonder if this is what I mean, I wonder if what she thought would happen is she would show up, kill the man who allegedly attacked her child and go, she would go to prison. And that was something she may have been fine with. I do not know. I do but not know. Not to think ahead of I mean, you can see what happens when you make these kinds of decisions through an irrational mind of rage and anger and hurt and devastation. And I couldn't I, I couldn't even fathom what she was feeling that day. But you're not thinking about all of the things that can go wrong. You know, it's one thing to risk your own life, but it's quite another to risk the lives of those around you. And then there's also this, it's like this energy that builds in a situation like that, where the others who joined in, you could say, well, maybe some of them tried to pull her back. They may have, or they may have also gotten wrapped up in that fury and that moment and the energy and the adrenaline. Nobody was thinking straight here. Nobody was thinking straight. And it is a tragedy. It is a tragedy. But an innocent teen was killed in this crossfire unnecessarily. You know, a young person who, you know, those of us, you know, who are parents of young adults, we know that their brains are not fully formed, at least until they're 25. And if this 19-year-old fully an adult, I mean, was he in a position to make the wisest choice in a situation like this, he doesn't Certainly have not. the life experiences. He should, he shouldn't have gone. But he was young, maybe too young to truly understand the consequences about what was about to unfold. A truly and my heart breaks for his mom. Oh my God, awful! You know, my heart breaks for his mom and for the five young siblings who were in the house who had nothing to do with the allegations against their older brother. So then you have one of those you know kids could have been hit it's just it really was a recipe for utter disaster and that's what we saw it could have been worse but it certainly could have been better oh it's just so sad it is time for our comment section these are the crime cases y'all are talking about on social media our producer will updike is here and as i've been reminded by all of you on youtube i need to ask will will how are you (laughs) I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. Um, Yeah, I'm excited that summer is here. Um, I'm I'm feeling it. I'm I'm great. I'm I'm doing great. I'm on the East Coast. It is not summer. Oh, yikes. Okay, well, sorry. (laughs) I'll enjoy it doubly so, so I enjoy it for (laughs) you you. as well, Caitlin. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This week, we got a case of a big heist with sort of an interesting uh, mode of entry. This case comes out of Tom's River, New Jersey, where bandits allegedly made away with around a million dollars in jewelry in, well, I said elaborate heist in my in my script here. It's not that elaborate, uh, which I'll get into in just a sec. But the incident occurred at Venzio Jewelers in the Ocean County Mall uh, sometime between 8 p.m. on March 27th and 10 a.m. on March 28th. Uh, so employees of the jeweler called law enforcement that morning, the 28th, just after 10 a.m. Uh, and again, they said that this robbery somewhere in the neighborhood of one million dollars i never know how they value those things or evaluate it or anyways i'll I'll get into that later but so how did the thieves get into this how did they get away with this it wasn't you know your danny ocean type of heist there was apparently a vacant shop in the mall uh right next to where this jeweler was and they simply broke in to the vacant uh storefront there and drilled a hole through the wall a uh, big, big hole, uh, which is just, I mean, it's a great way to do it. It's so simple. Uh, but they also, I guess, like cut the phone lines and stuff. So I don't know if that would have disabled the alarm because it, it is a little it is a little perplexing to me in this that no, I would think that alarms or something would still go off even if you're cutting mm-hmm. through, a, 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 like even if you're cutting through the wall. So I'm not really sure how that happened. Um, and, I, and then they also were able to use a torch to open this large safe in the back. Um, which, you know, just, just classic stuff. There's no safe cracking. It's kind of like, um, it's more of like a blue collar robbery, which I like, kind of like Michael Mann's thief. Um, <laughs> so they, they, they didn't touch, however. So they, like I said, they, they, they kind of had an idea or it seems like they had an idea what they were going after because they, they went for this safe. They didn't really touch any of the merchandise that had been left on the jewelry room floor. I, I'm guessing that they kind of leave some of the displays out at night and maybe don't put everything in the safe. Um, but the investigation into like the exactly how much is lost uh, is still ongoing. 
And interestingly, too, no suspects have been arrested or named in this. So this was like a pretty smooth caper. Like they might they might have gotten away with something here. Um, I don't know. Uh, Caitlin, would you have a perfect crime? Like what would what would your perfect do you do you have like a, a petty crime that you think you would get away with easily? I'm certainly smart enough not to tell you how I would do it so that when and if I pull this off, no one will ever know. But this is That's a peak jer- jersey bulldozing their way into a jewelry store so that they can outfit all their gumads all over town. I love this. I can say this. I'm from New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey right now at my mom's house. I'm allowed to say that, but it's peak Jersey. All of the women in Tom's River are going to start to be like iced out in the next couple of weeks. And that's how they're going to find these guys. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree with Caitlin. I agree with Caitlin. Yes, I've spent much time in the state of New Jersey working as a reporter <laughs> for a very long time. Very familiar with Tom's Tom's River in Ocean County. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I kind of yep. like if they're just spreading this back out. If it's not going for sale, it's like a Robin Hood type thing. Um, I'm kind of with it. I, I, I don't I, know, I, I like but there that. are, I mean, there are some very logical questions here because most jewelry stores have so much, so much security that that you would think the system, if you cut one thing, is going to trip another alarm. I mean, there's just no way. And I know the Ocean County Mall may be old and has been around for decades. I get that. But still. Yeah. Listen, uh, we had a Come commentary. Mother's Day. Come Mother's Day. You're <laughs> oh going to see gosh. a lot of moms with I didn't even think about cross that. necklaces and some sparkling earrings around Tom's River. And I'm telling you, that is how they are going to, because, you know, these towns are small out here. That's how they're going to track down these thieves is that they're going to start seeing 12 carat earrings running around town at the Wawa. And that's what <laughs> we're going to find. <laughs> I love the Wawa. <laughs> getting a, yeah, getting your jewels on and go to the Wawa. I love that. And um, for those of you who don't caught. know what the Wawa is, it is a regional, like, 7-Eleven, you know, yeah. based oh. out of, oh, I said with regional really good, convenience. Really okay, sandwiches. regional convenience oh store, calm it's down. It's not like 7-Eleven. No, I know it's really, really good. No, it is really good. They make fabulous, fresh Thank you. sandwiches. And it really is called Wawa. W-A-W-A, Wawa. This is my first word. Wawa, oh my what? God, the Wawa is kid. great. It was my first word as a baby. I know, my mother used to love to walk down to the Wawa. <laughs> to pick up lunch <laughs> yeah you can't beat it you can't you beat it that's that incredible sandwiches that's all go on will <laughs> yeah wait, uh we got a bunch of comments on this one uh josie f was kind of dubious of how this all uh happened they said quite honestly owner should have thunk of that which i guess who's responsible if there's an empty storefront next to the jewelry place right and there's not like security going on on that is that a little bit on the mall? I don't really know. Because yeah. I would start to get, I I mean, now especially, I would start to get worried if there was like an empty storefront or something like there's a there's a pretty clear point of entry there. Um, Christy S. was like really uh, questioning how much this actually was and how much the thieves would get. They said just because they got $1 million in jewelry, they still have to find people to buy that said jewelry, right? Won't that be hard to do? And isn't the jewelry store insured so they get their money back? Um, Hopefully. Which is interesting. We got some people kind of uh, tinfoil Making hat. allegations. <laughs> T- yeah, like uh, we got some tinfoil hat theories that maybe the jewelers here were involved and this is like a whole... This is like a whole thing. Which we have um, absolutely no proof of, nor are we suggesting. We're not suggesting it at all. I'm saying other people have suggested it. Certainly not us. Uh, Jesse L said the jewelry store must have been a real hole in the wall. Oh, Ooh. got it. Got it's it. It's out there. It's out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I called these robbers the mole men. Binary fairy said the bandits shouldn't be called the mole men. <laughs> Obviously, they should be called the whole men, which I don't think uh, I don't think that's going to really uh happen that, that doesn't really that's not the right type of headline i think for this type of story but anyways that is going to do it for this week's comment section thank you so much to everybody who left those you can do that over on our youtube community page we're also on facebook x uh and what else i don't know instagram TikTok. i think we're on instagram. tiktok we're occasionally on TikTok. something happens on tiktok um, before they shut now. it down <laughs> before now. they shut it down for now <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah thank you so much and i will see you all next week bye will Bye. So, Caitlin, I am still so excited for you and your new job. Again, massive congratulations. So you. you were at the Baltimore Bridge Collapse. What? I was at the Baltimore Bridge Collapse in a boat on the Patapsco River. So I was within about a thousand yards from it because that was the, the cutoff point for 
the Coast Guard because they were still doing um, search at that point. And I was in the river in the rain um, shooting live shots so that I could get as close as possible. And and I actually, I feel like you are someone who can appreciate the surreal moment of being somewhere like this and having the captain of the sailboat I was on say, keep your eyes out for debris and potentially bodies because there were still people who are missing. There's still four individuals to this day that are still missing there. And it's something that when you're covering these stories, it, there's the gravity of them can't be really overstated. And then even as a reporter, we're sitting there looking out for these missing men. It's horrific when you're at a scene of such devastation. I remember covering um, an airplane crash out on Long Mm -hmm. Island, and um, the debris field was enormous, and people's personal belongings Mm -hmm. were showing up constantly, you know, because the bags and everything had opened, and they were floating in the bay. And to see a piece of someone's life float by you, the it is such an immense loss and and the catastrophe it's it is surreal it isn't it 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 is news right but it's lives it's just it's it's a lot to process caitlin it's a lot to process it really is and the type of news that we cover is sort of that death and devastation and crime so you're we're never there on anybody's best day we're never there and when anybody's having a good time we're usually there when it's the worst possible case scenario that you can think of it was the same thing when i covered lake and riley's murder in georgia i walked along the running trail where she was bludgeoned to death because you need as a reporter to get an idea of what 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 did she go through where was she you know what were the clues could something else have been different and so to sort of live through that after the fact is is like you said very surreal wow and you're headed to cover the eclipse headed to cover so actually finally i will be there on someone's good day there you go that's exciting (laughs) yep so i'm going to niagara to cover the eclipse i'll be in the path of totality which will be a nice a nice balm for all the Look at the crime and murder that I end up covering for the majority of the time. You know, just this week I was working on, I sat down with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations to talk about the missing women um, Mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. There's two mothers that were out, you know, driving to pick up someone's children on a Saturday. They've been missing for now three days and they found the car abandoned and have no idea where these women went. So it's always, it's always something. It really is. It really is. Well, Caitlin, it's always a pleasure. Congratulations again. We'll Thank be looking you. for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Allergies. Everything is Ugh, in bloom here in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Massive congratulations. We'll be looking you. for you on News Nation. We hope that when you get a moment, you can join us again. We love your insight. I will be back. I will absolutely be back. I can always make time for this. And where can people follow you besides watching you on News Nation? Besides News Nation, the best way to get me is on Instagram. It's at Caitlin Becker, so just at my name. And if you have stories or tips or just want to chat, reach out. Excellent. All right. And you can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. I talk about crime. I also talk about rescue dogs. Those are the two things in my life. How those two converge, where they converge is where you find me. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) You can find this podcast, all our podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also comment on our YouTube channel. That's where we have a vibrant community. Want to hear your thoughts on on justice and what you think of these cases. Sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So, so until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs> <laughs>